nature of the problem that you're trying to solve, and this can be uh, incorporated in constraints. Something that uh, we worked on uh, uh, two years ago with a student is uh, learning with fairness constraints. So I will not talk about fairness, but this is an active research area in, in machine learning, and uh, one can formulate this as an optimization problem where you're imposing some kinds of constraints on the output of your model. So this is uh, another application of this. And so there are many other applications, just to give you kind of a, a flavor of what people do in the literature, uh, using this framework, we, we solve optimal control problems. Uh, you can think of PDA constrained optimization problems, uh, various network flow problems. Uh, safer enforcement learning is something that uh, I've uh, worked with a student and, and collaborators. All of these uh, problems can be cast as a uh, stochastic optimization problem with uh, uh, deterministics and all sometimes the stochastic constraints. Okay, so there are many uh, applications. And now that I've maybe at least tried to convince you that this is an interesting problem to solve, let me uh, try to say, well, how should we go about solving that? But uh, Martin suggested first, uh, you know, this should be maybe an introductory talk suitable for, for students. Let me kind of just remind you what uh, what we do in the context of unconstrained problems. So if you have some uh, objective function f and we want to minimize it, so there are no constraints. What to do? Well, uh, you know, the first uh, thing I've learned is that I know how to take a derivative of a function or maybe take a gradient of the function. And this is what exactly what we'll do. We'll use uh, gradient descent to... Uh, minimize the function of f, uh, f of x. Um, the function f of x, uh, we don't have to impose uh, uh, much. We'll just say that the gradient is uh, Lipschitz continuous uh, with parameter uh, L, and then the gradient descent algorithm is, is extremely simple. You start somewhere, and then you update your iterates by moving in the direction of the negative gradient, uh, and you move some amount alpha in, in that uh, direction, and you stop at some point. Maybe your iteration budget is exceeded, or you get to a point where the gradient is small and uh, you don't make much progress and, and you stop. Right? But uh, you know the big picture is that uh, uh, in the gradient descent, what we are assuming is that we have some value uh, f of x. Uh, this is our current like, iterate x. And uh, we don't quite know which function we're optimizing. We don't know how the function f globally looks like. The only thing that uh, uh, we know is uh, we can construct somehow a local approximation. We can come up with a model for um, our unknown function f. Typically, this model is a quadratic model. Why? Because we can compute the minimizer of this quadratic objective in a closed form. And then uh, this gives us the subsequent uh, iterate. And we, you know, um, this is essentially the pictorial view of uh, what's happening in the gradient descent. So we have a model of the uh, objective that you're minimizing, we minimize this model exactly, and we keep going until uh, we decide to stop. Uh, and uh, what we can prove about this uh, gradient descent is that if your uh, step size parameter alpha is suitably chosen, so it's uh, in the range between zero and two over L, then uh, what we'll have is that this uh, um, KKT residuals uh, bounded, and this implies then that uh, your gradient converges to a stationary point. Okay, so we're not assuming convexity or anything like that. We'll just uh, say that this converges to a stationary point. And the proof is very simple. The only thing like we know how to do is uh, we know how to take a Taylor expansion. So we uh, kind of do second order Taylor expansion. We upper bound the second uh, term. And then uh, this first term in the expansion, this guarantees you a uh, descent. Okay, so this guarantees that you decrease uh, sufficiently. And uh, the second term, uh, we can obtain in the following form just by uh, plugging in what the uh, update rule is. And then from here, it's obvious that if all your step size alpha is sufficiently small, then uh, you will be guaranteeing a descent in each uh, iteration. And then rearranging these things, we, we get the state. OK. Uh, now, the key kind of challenge uh, here is, of course, like how do we choose this uh, gradient uh, step size? Uh, if we choose it 
uh, too big, then your iterates might oscillate. Uh, if the gradient step size is uh, uh, too small, the, it will converge uh, very, very slowly. And it's difficult to find kind of uh, the right uh, step size parameter. And in the deterministic setting, uh, kind of like our tried and tested tool is backtracking line search, which uh, has an inner loop to select uh, the step size. And we see that then uh, the convergence is uh, obtained in, in few, uh, uh, fewer iterations than uh, pre-specified step size. Okay, so this is uh, what happens in the uh, deterministic case. Now, if we move to the stochastic uh, case, then um, the thing's a little bit more uh, tricky, uh, at least from the analysis point of view. From the algorithmic point of view, the setting is the same as before. So we have some uh, objective that we want to minimize. Uh, the gradient of this objective is uh, Lipschitz continuous. Uh, the algorithm is the same as before, but rather than taking the gradients, that rather than updating our iterates using the gradient, here we have some estimate of the gradient. We have something that in expectation is exactly equal to the, to the gradient. And otherwise the algorithm is exactly the same. We stop at some, uh, uh, some point. Okay, this is not necessarily uh, a descent method, uh, but in expectation it is. So if we do the same kind of argument as before, we do Taylor expansion. Uh, we have again the following uh, equation, but now the problem is that uh, GK is, uh, is random. It, uh, given your current iterate, there's a noise in uh, how we uh, obtain the estimate of the, of the gradient at the current point. And we cannot guarantee that uh, this is going to result in, uh, in this end. Okay, um, no problem. We, we can prove that in expectation, it, it then uh, is a descent uh, algorithm. Yes, and eventually will uh, we'll descend. Okay, and so in particular, what uh, one can show, which is a, uh, it's something that you would learn in an optimization course, if the gradients have bounded variants, so we, we already assumed that the gradient is an uh, unbounded estimate of the true gradient. But if we further assume that this has bounded variance, then depending if we choose the alpha k uh, as a constant step size, we obtain that the residuals converge to a neighborhood of some radius that, that depends on the uh, size of the noise. And if the step size decreases, then you can uh, prove that the residuals go to uh, zero. So you have convergence to a stationary point. This is kind of summarized in the uh, picture that I took from uh, Frank Curtis' uh, slides. Um, we have that, you know, if the step size is constant, then you converge to radius to, to a neighborhood of the optimum, and then you kind of oscillate. And if you choose the decaying step size, then uh, you will slowly get to, uh, to the minimizer. Now, again, like the question is obvious, like how do we actually choose this uh, step size? Uh, the performance of the algorithm is going to depend quite a lot on how the step size is chosen. So then uh, it's only recent work from um, Katja Schamberg and uh, Fekhet that uh, tells you how to do the uh, line search in a stochastic setting. And uh, in today's talk, essentially what I'm going to tell you is how can we extend these ideas and develop an, a line search procedure for uh, optimization problems where we have uh, um, uh, constraints. Okay, so this is kind of a summary of uh, what happens when we don't have constraints. And now let's look into uh, you know, our uh, quality constraint problems. So we have a stochastic optimization problem, uh, objective is stochastic, constraints are deterministic, um, so how can we uh, develop a procedure that will not require fine tuning of the parameters, which uh, will affect the performance of the algorithm? So the algorithm is going to be developed on uh, sequential quadratic optimization. So this is a framework that we, is very popular uh, in, in handling constraints. There are other approaches, so like uh, trust region methods, uh, things like... Um, Interior point methods are alternative approaches to handling uh, constraints, but this is one that's uh, very popular and, and effective in, in practice. And you know the, the subsequent papers will handle uh, other extensions. But for now, we essentially develop uh, sequential quadratic programming 
for, for this problem. Uh, kind of the intuition is uh, how will we um, be able to develop fine search? Well, similar to uh, the previous work, we'll uh, be allowed to compute mini batches of samples to get an estimate that's accurate enough of your uh, objective. And then uh, the adaptivity will be um, obtained by extending the work from uh, Paquette and uh, Schoenberg. Okay, so, um, of course, we are not the first ones to consider stochastic optimization with constraints. Uh, if you look at uh, some recent papers in the uh, um, NeurIPS uh, world, uh, typical approaches to handling fitting neural networks with constraints is uh, penalty-based methods. So you, you take the constraint, you put it uh, as a kind of Lagrange, kind of a term in, in the objective. I mean, you, you com come up with a penalty and then you crank up the penalty parameter so that as the penalty parameter goes to infinity, you're going to reach a uh, feasible solution for, for the problem. But this has kind of well-known uh, drawbacks in that, uh, I mean, convergence can be quite slow. Um, an alternative is to use projected uh, methods. But the projected methods uh, are sometimes, uh, it's, it's not easy to compute the projection on the null space of your constraint. So if you have a linear, let's say, affine constraint, you know, you don't really need uh, something fancy. Like projected methods uh, will work very well, but for general nonlinear constraints, uh, it might be difficult to project on the null space. Um, and so I would say like the most closely related work to what I'm presenting to you is work from uh, Vera Haas, Frank Curtis, and, and his group at uh, Lehigh. Um, they consider a fully stochastic setting, uh, meaning that for each time you draw only one sample for your objective. But um, I'll discuss to you some differences between our approach and, and what they do um, uh, in a bit uh, more details in a few minutes. Okay. So uh, first, what I'm going to tell you is uh, a brief introduction about sequential periodic programming in a deterministic case. So let me just tell you, you know, what people knew uh, 30 years ago or, or more how to solve deterministic problems with, with constraints. Um, so the, the problem in a deterministic setting is just like before, we have objective, we have a constraint, but uh, unlike stochastic setting here, we are able to obtain the full gradient of, of the objective. For notational purposes, we'll use Lagrangian function. So this is a, um, we have objective plus Lagrange multipliers times the, the constraints. So this is uh, called a Lagrange uh, function. And uh, typically what we want uh, in order to find a stationary point for uh, our problem, we want to find a, uh, a KKT point, which is, which is satisfying essentially that the gradient of your Lagrange function is equal to, to zero. This is what we would like to, to do. If we find such a point, this is a stationary point for, for our objective. And so the sequential quadratic programming uh, algorithms can be viewed in, in two ways. It can be viewed as a, an algorithm that gives you a stationary point of, for, for this uh, <coughs> Lagrange function. Or it can be viewed as a uh, minimizer of the following constrained uh, quadratic problem. So the two views are the same. The, the second view is very useful for developing an algorithm. The first view is useful for, uh, for the analysis. So essentially, um, you know, by irrespective of whether we think of SQP as an algorithm that finds a stationary point for the Lagrange or a minimizer of this constraint problem, the solution to both problems will give us the following Newton system uh, update. And so here, G is a uh, gradient of the constraints. And so the, um, by solving this uh, Newton system, we will uh, be able to find kind of a direction in which we should, uh, we should move. And so in, in a gradient descent, we move in the direction of the negative gradient. In uh, SQP, we are going to solve the following Newton system. So we'll find delta x and delta lambda. So how should we move in the primal space? How should we move in the dual space? And then we'll uh, make some uh, update based on these, uh, these variables. 
So this is a, it's like a vanilla kind of big idea of what, what happens in the sequential variety program. Any, any questions about um, this? I'm not sure if, uh, if you guys teach, you guys teach on optimization, on linear optimization? Okay, good. So you can ask maybe how do you solve this sniffing system? Oh, I don't know. There's a, other people have solved it. Yeah. Um, but that, that's a good question. Like so, so solving this, um, you know, whether we have like a uh, exact solver, do we use approximate solver? Uh, okay, so how would you uh, solve it? Um, yeah, so, in, in some sense, uh, there, there are multiple kind of uh, ways to uh, solve this. Like this we discuss like CG in mm -hmm. one way because you don't want to form the meditation, or you can use some <coughs> approximate meditation in the DBOGA. So. But so here, I mean, like the in order to ensure global convergence, which is we are not doing local convergence, but this uh, approximation to the Hessian, um, we, we are going to take as an identity matrix. So we just need some matrix that has uh, lower bound in the eigenvalues and the upper bound in the uh, eigenvalues. Um, so in order to get local convergence, one would need uh, uh, maybe a uh, a better uh, approximation to the uh, Hessian of the Lagrangian. Okay, so, but even if I solve this uh, system, one question that you should ask is how, how much should I move in, the, in the, this direction? How much should I move in the uh, direction of delta x, delta 1? Okay, so um, in, um, in the gradient descent setting, we can have a uh, uh, kind of like a line search procedure, but for constraints, it's a bit more challenging. Like if I could move in the direction and, and reduce the objective value, but that might result in the constraints being more kind of violated. And in another case, I could have a move that makes my point more feasible, but uh, the expense is uh, that the objective value increases. So it's kind of like not immediately clear how much should we move and what kind of uh, updates should we uh, actually uh, accept. Okay. So, um, Therefore, when we use uh, sequential quadratic programming, typically we have a merit function. The like most popular, most commonly used merit function would be to have a, uh, uh, to add an L1 penalty for, for the constraints. So you have a objective uh, plus uh, some penalty times the uh, L1 uh, normal of the constraints. It is known that such uh, merit functions suffer from Marcos effects. Um, and in, in the, what this means is that uh, you cannot choose uh, sufficiently large steps uh, to ensure superlinear convergence. And so then one needs to um, use modifications to, to such an approach. And here, what I'm going to present to you is, is a algorithm, a, a small modification of the algorithm by Lucidi in, in 1990. Uh, who used uh, the following differentiable exact augmented uh, Lagrangian. So here we have our Lagrangian function. We have a one penalty term, which uh, tells us how uh, much of a feasibility error we have. And another term that penalizes the uh, optimality error. And, uh, you know, this matrix G, this is the... Uh, um, the, 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 the matrix of the uh, gradients of, of the constraint um, is added uh, here. So as to make this parameter new, um, kind of, we, we can choose it in any way we want. We can set it say as, as one, okay? So it's not really uh, essential, but uh, we can, it allows us to not worry about them. So in, in this uh, setting, there are, uh, this parameter new is an adaptive parameter. So in order to ensure convergence to a stationary point of the original problem, we will need new, uh, sorry, we will need this parameter mu to, to increase. Uh, so it needs to be large enough to ensure the convergence to a resilient point. And so the algorithm uh, by Lucidi solves the following linear system and uh, chooses the 
direction in which to update primal point and the dual point as uh, the solution of this uh, system. So delta x, and delta lambda are going to be uh, is going to be the search direction. So in the vanilla SQP problem, typically delta x and delta hat lambda are the search directions. Here we'll uh, use the uh, search direction as uh, delta x and delta lambda, not delta hat. Lambda. Okay. Um, so the once we find this uh, search direction, we would like to move uh, as follows. So we would like to update the iterates, primal and dual iterates, by moving in that direction by some parameter alpha. And uh, uh, alpha is chosen so that uh, uh, the following Garmijo condition uh, holds. So the um, you know, we would like to make sufficient progress and uh, if sufficient progress is made if, uh, if the following uh, condition is uh, satisfied. So just some remarks. Um, the reason we are using delta lambda as the dual search direction is because uh, we want to ensure global uh, convergence. So if VK is a good approximation of the Hessian of the Lagrangian, and uh, our current iterate is close to a stationary point, then the two search directions are actually quite uh, similar. But if an iterate is far from the KKD point, or VK is not a good approximation of the Hessian, then the, um, the two directions could be quite uh, quite different. And in our implementation, the, uh, the BK, the approximation is just going to be an identity. So we cannot really claim that that's a good approximation to the, to the Hessian, okay? Um, okay, so that uh, uh, then gives us the following algorithm. This is an adaptive algorithm. Um, it updates two parameters. It updates the parameter uh, new, mu, which um, is, is the penalty parameter. It updates the parameter delta, which uh, kind of controls how much progress we make in the, each procedure. And actually the third parameter that is updated is the, uh, the step size parameter uh, lambda that's chosen by the, by the line change. Okay, so somehow the idea is that uh, once mu is large enough, then uh, we will simply update the, the parameters with the, um, the line search. But the question is like, you know, how, how do we set this uh, mu parameter? It needs to be large enough, but if it's too big, then uh, there will be numerical issues with the algorithm. So we, this is updated uh, in the following while loop to, to make it uh, uh, big enough. So this is the Lucidi's uh, adaptive SQP procedure. And this is going to be the skeleton of what we want to develop for the, um, for the stochastic setting. And, but this is kind of like a building point. Now, probably you wonder like, well, you know, is this going to converge? Like, uh, are we guaranteed that this is going to stop in finite time? You have this weird while loop, so why is this not going to increase uh, indefinitely? Um, and, but, you know, under some reasonable assumptions that people are making all the time in the literature, in particular, we assume that the iterates line and convex, uh, convex set, the functions uh, objective and the constraints are three times differentiable. Uh, we never compute third derivatives in the context of the algorithm, but um, in order to prove that this converges, the, these are um, required. In particular, um, in I didn't emphasize this, but uh, this matrix M involves, uh, in order to kind of control that, we, we require uh, the derivatives because this is, this involves a Hessian uh, inside. Okay, but uh, what else do we assume? We assume um, that uh, the Jacobian has a full rank, and uh, we assume that uh, the approximation to the um, uh, to the Hessian has a um, lower bound on the eigenvalues and. Uh, um, on the on the null space of uh, G. Yeah, so these are kind of like the assumptions that, that people uh, make. Or, and uh, with these assumptions, then any from starting from any point, uh, the iterates of this uh, algorithm are going to converge to a stationary point. Okay, so that's uh, uh, what what we have. Uh, in for, for the deterministic case. Now, let's try to uh, adapt this to a stochastic setting. Okay, so uh, can we develop a stochastic algorithm for 
uh, for this. And first, we'll, I'll tell you about a non-adaptive version. So that meaning means that we'll pre-specify the parameter mu and we'll pre-specify the step size alpha. Um, they will depend on somehow unknown parameters of, of your problem. And we'll see, kind of, we'll establish a result analogous to stochastic gradient descent just for a constrained uh, problem. Um, again, to remind you, in the stochastic setting, you can only get samples to estimate function f. Uh, in addition to the assumptions we saw on the previous slide, we will assume that uh, these uh, gradient estimates and the Hessian estimates are unbiased and have bounded uh, uh, variance. And uh, we'll assume that to, in each iteration, we'll generate two samples. One is going to be used to estimate function f, and the other one is going to be, sorry, one is going to be used to estimate the, uh, the gradient, and the other one is going to be used to estimate the, the Hessian. It's not ideal, but somehow makes the analysis uh, easier if the, the things are independent. So there's a lot of uh, annotation, but from, from this kind of like, from this slide, all I want you to remember is that things that have bar on top are random quantities. Okay, so the Hessian approximation, the gradient of your, uh, the Jacobian of the constraints, uh, and this uh, uh, CK, these are all deterministic given the uh, current iterate. And the, the only thing that where the randomness comes into play is the uh, objective. So the, here is the, uh, gradient of your Lagrange function. And then we have randomness in this M coming from the approximation of the, uh, of the Hessian, the Sohatic approximation of the Hessian. Then we solve this system, we obtain the dual search direction, and then we update uh, using the following uh, update rule. Alpha K is a pre-specified. I'm not talking about adaptive algorithm here. I just want something that, uh, that is pre-specified. Uh, pre like think of it as a one over L thing or, or one over uh, k, where k is the iteration sequence. So what we can prove under kind of the same assumption as before, kind of the technical lemma first tells us that the search direction is unbiased for the true search direction. And also we, we have a bound on the variance or the bound on the norm of the uh, search direction. And uh, this is close to what you would have uh, in, in the deterministic setting. And then just to briefly show you on one slide analysis. So just like before, the only thing we know is to take derivatives and uh, Taylor expansion. So we perform Taylor expansion of the augmented uh, exact differentiable Lagrangian. Um, so then we have a linear term. So we would like this first linear term to guarantee sufficient uh, reduction so it needs to be uh, sufficiently negative. And we would like that this term is somehow small once the alpha is uh, sufficiently, once it's suitably chosen, okay? So if the penalty parameter is bigger than some mu tilt, mu tilt depends on your problem parameters. And so this is kind of like an issue. We will need to have an adaptive algorithm to choose mu to be bigger than this unknown threshold. Um, but if we somehow, when Bernie told us, so if like if a graduate student tried enough values and uh, chose one that's bigger than mu tilt, then uh, we will have sufficient decrease. So this inner product is going to be uh, smaller than this uh, negative quantity, which is good. Uh, and furthermore, like by analyzing the search direction system, we have a bound of this form. If we combine this, plugging it up there, we see that uh, for this linear term, we'll get uh, sufficient decrease delta. Um, and then for that thing, we, we can bound it uh, uh, in, in this way. And so here you can see that if this alpha k is chosen so that this term here is uh, positive, then uh, uh, things work out. So if, if alpha is smaller than some quantity, this is positive, <coughs> and we get the kind of following recursion, which tells us that in expectation, we get the descent on the merit function. So this is uh, great, but the problem is we don't know what mu tilde is. This is somehow a problem-dependent parameter, and this is another quantity that is uh, problem-dependent, and uh, we don't have um, kind of access to it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, at the end of the day, what we can prove for this non-adaptive algorithm 
is that, um, well, first, if we have a constant step size that is smaller than this unknown threshold, then we get the convergence to a neighborhood of, um, of the stationary point, and the size of the neighborhood depends on the bound the variance. And if the step size sequence is going to zero, uh, then we have that the KKT residuals go to, to zero, meaning that we converge to a stationary point. And these results are um, almost sure. Uh, this convergence to a stationary point is almost sure convergence, meaning that for any run, um, we will converge. Okay. Um, this almost sure convergence, we use some super Malikingale uh, argument to uh, prove that. Um, I, I want to emphasize that the algorithm is not practical because upper bounds on the penalty parameter and the upper bound on the step size, we need to tune that manually. So graduate student needs to um, you know, choose these different parameters to uh, choose parameters that will result in convergence. Uh, just a brief comment on the work um, of Berahas and, and Frank Curtis and, and the group is uh, they develop an adaptive scheme. However, the adaptive scheme also requires some pre-specified sequence beta k, which uh, uh, is used to control the step size. And in, in simulations, we'll see that uh, somehow the convergent behavior of the adaptive algorithm to some extent depends on this uh, uh, sequence beta k. So it's not fully adaptive, but they require, let's say, a weaker set of assumptions compared to us. Um, okay, so the next step that uh, I want to tell you about is how can we make this algorithm now adaptive? So, so far, what I've told you, I've told you what we knew 30 years ago, how to solve deterministic problems. Uh, then in the second part, afterwards, I told you how we can incorporate stochasticity into that uh, skeleton. This results in an algorithm that is not very practical. So now I want to build on that skeleton and make it uh, something that's more practical. I'm not going to go as far to say that it's practical, but uh, at least it's a first stab at uh, making fully uh, adaptive algorithm. Any, any questions so far? Okay, so. Um, let me at least uh, try to convince you uh, what are the challenges in the, in the stochastic setting. So this is kind of like what we need to overcome in the design of our algorithm. So first, we would like to use uh, stochastic line search. Okay, so you know, I would like to find step size alpha so that this uh, Armijo condition holds. But the problem is I don't have access to the merit function. And the problem is that if I don't have access to the merit function, um, I may have like a bad estimate of the merit function or a bad estimate of the gradient of the merit function, then that might result in the step size just becoming too small. So I make uh, not, uh, not enough progress. Another difficulty is that uh, if the merit function is random, uh, if I even if I make kind of decrease of the merit function, these decreases may not accumulate for the the true merit function that they actually care about. Okay, so um, to solve these kind of issues, what we'll require is that we can uh, get good enough uh, estimate of the model. So somehow I'll be allowing my algorithm to collect a batch of data, let's say collect 100 observations or 500 observations and reasonably accurately estimate the, the merit function. So that's uh, one, uh, one thing that, uh, uh, we need to overcome it, and the way we'll overcome it is simply by allowing batches of, of samples. There are more challenges. So the, the other challenge is uh, that uh, the search direction, the, the solution to the linear system, delta x, delta lambda, uh, that is going to be a descent of this uh, merit function, the augmented uh, exact Lagrangian, only if the penalty parameter is large enough. Again, so the penalty parameter is also somehow a random quantity. It's going to be updated uh, through, the, uh, through the algorithm. And uh, so this is going to be, we'll have a random walk on this uh, penalty parameter. And we'll need to somehow show that uh, this is going to stabilize after some number of uh, iterations. 
there are more problems. So another problem is that uh, we are designing an algorithm that is going to converge to a stationary point of this uh, augmented uh, exact Lagrangian. But the stationary point of augmented Lagrangian is not necessarily a KKT point for our problem. So we have the following relationship that the gradient of the augmented Lagrangian is equal to the sum matrix times the gradient <coughs> of uh, the Lagrange function. Now, you can think that if this matrix doesn't have full rank, then you know this could be in the null space of this matrix. So we could have a stationary point of uh, augmented Lagrangian that is not a KKT point of the uh, original uh, problem. So again, the, the, the way to solve this is uh, we need to ensure that mu is big enough. So if mu is, is large, then this matrix is going to be invertible and we don't have this, uh, this problem. Now, the problem is um, in, in our algorithm, what we can show is that after some number of iterations, the, the penalty parameter mu is going to stabilize. So you have a random walk, but after some number of iterations, you, you will not update the penalty parameter mu anymore. Now, uh, when mu stabilizes, it might be below or above the mu tilde, like some unknown uh, threshold above which uh, good things happen. So if the, stab the stabilization happens below the point where good things happen, uh, we might still have an issue. So the way we overcome this in the design of the algorithm is that we, uh, make, we keep increasing mu by enforcing that the visibility of the constraints is upper bounded by the gradient of the uh, augmented uh, differentiable Lagrangian. And this is something that we, we haven't found in the literature before. So in the design of these algorithms, this seems to be a, um, kind of a, a novel kind of like side condition. And it's not clear to us how to uh, change it. And we are also not sure that this is a, a good design for the algorithm. Uh, but uh, I, this what is what's something that allows us to prove things and, and it works reasonably well in, in simulations. But if you well, have some, the idea is how this could be uh, avoided. I'll, I'll be happy to hear. Okay, so um, no, the, the motivation for this condition is uh, that uh, if this thing is non-singular, then uh, the, the following um, implies, so the gradient of augmented Lagrangian being equal to zero implies that the, um, uh, this is a feasible stationary point. So in some sense, the design of the algorithm is going to ensure convergence to not any stationary point of the augmented Lagrangian, but to a feasible stationary point of the Lagrangian. That's uh, this one going to happen. Okay, so what is the algorithm? Let me uh, explain quickly the, the four steps. So the four steps are the following. So in the first step, we generate samples. From uh, for, that we are going to use to estimate the gradient and samples to estimate the, the hash time. Um, the caveat here is that these uh, samples need to be good enough so that some uh, good properties happen. Lucky for us, we can design a test that uh, generates the, the samples and then we can check. Uh, subsequently, we need to select the penalty parameter. So we solve the system, the linear system, this gives us a search direction delta x delta lambda. And we are going to select mu so that the following two things happen. So in the Lucidis algorithm that we had before, this was the, the condition. The, the delta that we had there, now we explicitly write as, uh, as this. Um, and the uh, additional thing that we require in our while loop is that the constraints are bounded by the, the norm of the augmented Lagrangian. So this second part, uh, this is uh, kind of an artifact or an addition to our algorithm. So the while loop is going to be increasing new until these two conditions are satisfied. Once this happens, we estimate the merit function. So we'll generate another batch of samples. Um, and uh, these are going to be uh, used to estimate the, the merit function. So we'll have the uh, 
the merit function at uh, test point. Uh, and uh, we'll essentially check, well, Uh, let me step back. So well, here, once we select the penalty parameter, we'll uh, propose a test point. So something that we would like to move uh, from the current iterate in the direction by alpha k. So this is our test point, and we need to decide should we accept that or not. We generate new batch of samples that we use to estimate the merit function. So we estimate the, the merit functions, and there is parameter epsilon that we kind of update through iterations that tells us how well we need to estimate the, the, the merit function. Um, and then we perform the Armijo condition. We check if the Armijo condition holds. If it holds, we accept the test point. We typically, we increase the, uh, the step size. So if we had a successful step size, then uh, the next time we'll be more courageous and we'll take even bigger step sizes. And then if we make, if we accept this step size, what, what we do is uh, we check whether we had enough uh, decrease. So we can have a successful step size, but uh, if the decrease of the merit function is uh, um, big enough, we will further allow ourselves to in the next steps, uh, in the next step have less accurate of the model. Uh, otherwise, in the next step, uh, we will require a more accurate model. So the epsilon k is somehow adaptive parameter that controls, uh, you know, how accurate model we want to estimate in each one of the uh, iterations. So the algorithm is uh, is as follows. So it's very similar to the algorithm we had three years ago, uh, but now it's stochastic. So we generate the samples, we solve the following. Um, we, we, we solve the linear system. Then with this uh, search direction, we check uh, the following while loop. So uh, we'll check if the sufficient decrease uh, can be achieved and the constraints are bounded by the gradient of the Aguento Lagrangian. Uh, then we generate another batch of samples. We estimate the merit function, perform the line search. And then depending on uh, whether we if we have a successful line search step, we'll also check whether it was a reliable step or unreliable, and uh, we'll update the parameters uh, um, accordingly. That's the um, kind of idea. Now, I don't have much time, so I'll just briefly say a uh, few things. The, the sample size required in the first step of the algorithm needs to be chosen so that some good event happens. So in particular, we need to be able to uh, estimate the gradient of the objective accurately now. So this is what uh, essentially the, the first condition holds. So this says estimate the gradient sufficiently. And then there's a lot of uh, mathematical uh, things. The problem here that I want to kind of point out is that somehow both on the left-hand side and right-hand side, you have a dependence on on the sample size. So what, what we do in practice is that you, you generate some sample size and then you evaluate these things and check if the event holds. Um, if, uh, if this thing does not hold, then you generate a, a bigger batch of samples. Uh, the sample size in step three, um, that we can simply generate based on uh, uh, without the while loop. So in, in this case, we need the while loop to generate the sample size. Here, we can simply use the epsilon uh, to decide the size for the for this step. This step says, I want my merit function to be accurately estimated. So in the first sample, we want gradient accurately estimated. In the second step, in the third step, we want merit function to be accurately estimated. And then under the same assumptions uh, as before, um, and a little bit actually hard, stronger assumptions. So we remember that for non-adaptive SQP algorithm, we only required a bound on the variance. Here we are assuming that these random things have uh, abounded, but essentially, um, we need some assumption that would allow us to use a Bernstein type uh, concentration argument. So for specifically for the sample size selection, 
problem. We use the Bernstein's concentration equality to kind of say that the things concentrate around the, the true gradient. Um, and that's not the, the, the kind of the bond that you would have from uh, Chernoff would not be uh, good enough with, with variance. So we need some assumptions, either the tail assumption or the boundedness assumption. Um, okay, so I'm running out of time. I'm not going to tell you about uh, uh, specific kind of like technical details. Um, we, well, one question again will be like, will this stop? Like I have these complicated while loops, is, is algorithm ever going to stop? And we prove that uh, indeed after some number of iterations, so depending on the run, uh, so different runs of the algorithm, there will be different K bar, but for any run, there exists a K bar, so that uh, for iterations after that K bar, things are somehow not changing anymore. Um, and this allows us to say, analyze the merit function afterwards. So somehow, for initially, you have some random walk, but after K bar iterations, your, your function that you are kind of trying to descend on stabilizes. Um, and then we kind of study what's happening after this K bar uh, iterations. Uh, how does this work? Well, you, you come up with a potential function. The potential function involves the uh, merit, it involves the accuracy of the merit function and the uh, uh, size of the KKT residuals. And what you're essentially saying is that after k by iterations, this potential is going to decrease. In each iteration, I'm going to decrease it. Um, so the analysis is changed over the three events. So if the gradient and the merit function is accurately estimated, then we have a descent of the potential. If it happens that the gradient is not correctly estimated, but the merit function is correctly estimated, or if the merit function is not correctly estimated, then the, this potential cannot increase much. So somehow, uh, if two things, if two good things happen, I descend on the, 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 the potential decreases, otherwise the potential doesn't increase much. Uh, and that then allows us to prove uh, one step error recursion for the potential. And then uh, we have one of the two uh, results. We have that, uh, um, we have essentially almost sure uh, convergence, or we have a uh, limit uh, convergence, depending on, well, what the, uh, well, th these are the two results that we obtain. So comparison to the non-adaptive stochastic SQP, um, the condition that uh, these things are smaller than zero imply that uh, alpha k has to decrease to zero. Whereas for us, you know, yes, we need uh, this thing to, to go to, um, well, for, for us, this alpha k can, arc, you, every so often it can uh, increase. It doesn't have to be a sequence that goes to, uh, to zero. Um, alpha k has a subsequence that is uh, lower bounded uh, away from zero, essentially. Also, comparison for the deterministic SQP uh, over there, alpha k is lower bounded away from zero, whereas plus we only have the, the subsequences uh, lower bounded away uh, from zero. So we cannot prove uh, limit um, for the KKT residuals to zero. We can only prove limit for the KKT residuals to be um, zero. So empirical results, uh, everybody, it uses the cutest uh, set to evaluate these things. Uh, we choose problems that are not too big. Uh, we choose problems where we don't recover non-singularity on the, the Jacobian. Um, and so there are 47 problems in this cutest test set that satisfy these uh, constraints. We compare uh, four different algorithms. So one is the adaptive procedure from Bear has uh, et al. Um, our non-adaptive stochastic SQP, our adaptive SQP, the, the algorithm that I'm selling you. And then the reviewers also asked us to kind of use the standard uh, SQP design where you add an L1 penalty, non-differentiable augmented Lagrangian, but uh, um, we still use our, our procedure to select the step size and, and the penalty parameter. 
Um, okay, so the QDIS package gives you a, uh, and for de de these are deterministic problems, so to make things stochastic, this is how we generate uh, stochastic data. So we add Gaussian noise around the deterministic estimates. Uh, we stop when the KTK residuals are small or we exceed the budget. Um, and then we have the following uh, uh, kind of pictures. So, so let me just show you a subset of the results. So we have a setting where, you know, we have a uh, constant uh, alpha K for the non-adaptive SQP. We have beta K is the sequence that controls the step size for the uh, um, L1 SQP by uh, uh, Berahas and uh, collaborators. Um, and so we see, you know, when, when the noise is uh, small, then all methods do well. It's essentially like a deterministic problem. But then uh, as the noise uh, goes up, we see that the adaptive SQP and uh, kind of, uh, the non-differentiable adaptive SQP converge to smaller uh, KKT uh, residuals. We also see that uh, the side sequence that controls the step size for the green method kind of does have effect on, on the convergence behavior. So that's something that uh, one might need to tune for different problems. Um, um, this plot shows you that um, there are some tuning parameters in our algorithm that control the size of the batches. And uh, this shows you that results are robust to the choice of the, these constants. Uh, we also kind of show the behavior of the step sizes for some problems. So you see that for, for different problems, like you, occasionally you get bigger step sizes which speed up uh, con uh, convergence. They don't kind of go to, to zero. Uh, inequality constraints, I don't have uh, time for this. The idea is to use active set uh, SQP and uh, the analysis is more kind of challenging, but the main idea is to combine what I've told you about with active set SQP. Um, and again, we have a kind of global convergence results. So in, in conclusion, you know, what I've told you is a an attempt at adaptive uh, SQP with, uh, with constraints. Uh, we've proven almost sure global convergence. We have some uh, interesting empirical results on uh, standard benchmark. Uh, but there are many, I think, uh, open problems. So this is like what I would like to work on with, uh, with students. So in particular, there are some things that are very immediate. Uh, so we don't have local convergence analysis. This is uh, missing. We don't know what the sample complexity is for, for our procedure. So I think this would be very interesting to solve, but also very challenging. As I told you, uh, we don't know how long it takes us to, to get to the region where the merit function stabilizes. So we know how to analyze things afterwards. But setting the random walk up until this K bar, uh, that's something that I think will need new ideas. There are things that my group already is uh, working on, which is developing um, kind of other approaches to solving problems with uh, SQP. So we're in particular looking into adaptive stochastic twist uh, region methods. So combine SQP within trust region algorithms. So this is an alternative to line search. Uh, we are investigating uh, usage of randomized linear solvers. Um, as, as Martin pointed out, uh, there's a linear system that needs to be solved. And so in a deterministic setting, one, one can use randomized linear solver. And that's not that clear uh, like how, to do, how to design an algorithm that would use a randomized solver. And then there are applications outside uh, of uh, uh, pure optimization that I'm excited about. So one thing that I've been thinking about is federated learning, uh, distributed learning with, uh, and so how, how does one incorporate constraints in that setting? Not quite clear. Like we have uh, um, kind of a lot of work in the last five years, say, on federated learning, but that does not consider constraints. Uh, another thing that I'm learning about is the RL. And so safe RL is uh, something that, uh, has a lot of uh, interesting applications. So some of the methods that we worked on here, how do we deploy them in the context of uh, uh, RL? Because there are things are uh, constraints and uh, objective uh, are stochastic. So that would be something uh, worthwhile exploring. Okay, so 
Thank you. And if you want to learn more, here are the um, two papers. Thank you very much. Any questions? So I almost have my lecture for the first one, I guess. Uh, I got maybe some question. I saw this uh, that you're using the same samples for gradients and hashons. Don't they have the issues in the algorithm because they will be dependent on each other? No, I, I think they are, they are independent, I think. I think it was the same as the length inside 34. I'm pretty sure uh, we, we develop things uh, independently. Uh, no, so no, those step those, one. Yes, yes. Now you the still XIG. So I was having the same issues in the proof. I'm using different in the in the implementation is the same samples usually. Right. So so here uh, we really write. We don't require them to be independent. Um, I think that the the idea is that uh, the the thing that you are using is this good event. So. If the good event happens, then uh, I mean you have the the bound, and that's the kind of like the thing that you're using in the in the proof. Almost like a code name, code name. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? We like still like minus five minutes to ask questions. <laughs> well, thank you for patiently uh, allowing me. To I like it so much.